Do I even have to say it? Let's just let's just get this out of the way early. So I just got to see Dune Part 2, the brand new film from director and amazing director, by the way, Denis Villeneuve, arguably the best director working in Hollywood today, definitely one of the top three. This is a sequel or a continuation of Dune Part 1, which came out in 2021. Of course, only the adaptation of the first book, and of course, we will also be getting the adaptation of the second book, Dune Messiah, eventually. Now, Dune Part 2 picks up exactly where we left up off in Dune Part 1 with Paul Atreides and his mom on the run from the Harkonnens, who just pretty much destroyed their entire family, killed everybody they loved uh, and they are now joining the Fremen these people that live in the deserts of Arrakis and they have to learn their ways and sort of just figure out how to be a Fremen and of course Paul gets swept up in this whole idea of this Messiah prophecy and this idea that he might be the Messiah and the holy shit and kind of like this war with the Harkonnens and eventually the Emperor and it just becomes this big epic grand amazing Game of Thrones like adventure and it is so unbelievably good. Now, this movie's hard to talk about without spoilers. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. I could just go over the basic stuff that you've probably heard every reviewer say about this movie over the last, I don't know, week or two. So I'll do that. I'll go over kind of like the basic stuff. And then at the end of the video, there will be a spoiler section because I do want to talk about some of the crazy shit that happens in this movie and where I think they're going to go next with the third one and, and some interesting choices that they made with this story. First up, we could talk about performances in this movie. There are so many great performances here. So many great actors in this cast. It's unbelievable. Timothy Chalamet, I think, is the best performance of his career. And it was kind of a, a deceptive performance. And what I mean by that is earlier in the movie, like the first hour, I just thought his performance was kind of... I don't want to use the word bland, but it didn't feel like anything new was coming from the character of Paul Atreides. I felt like I was watching kind of a watered-down version of the character from the previous movie. And then you, re you realize pretty quickly that that's kind of purposefully done. That's kind of intentionally done because his character goes through a massive transformation in this movie. And once that transformation happens... Timothy Chalamet puts out his best work of his career. There are some scenes that are absolutely incredible where Timothy Chalamet has to be this very strong, you know, central figure in this universe. And knowing the Dune story, it was hard to imagine Timothy Chalamet kind of playing that character. He has to play what is essentially a massive world leader. And to do that, he has to kind of emulate the energy of that. And he does. He actually stands out as somebody who could be a symbol, who could be this number one one huge person who's kind of sort of leading a movement and leading a people and it it really works zendaya obviously she gets a lot more to do in this movie than the first one the first one was really just a tease for her character and she is also great they actually brought a lot more depth to the character of shawnee than she had in the books i would even say she's much more conflicted in this version of the story not really sold on Paul as who everybody else believes him to be, a sort of messiah figure. She just kind of loves Paul the person, whereas everybody else, her family, her friends, sort of love him as this god-type figure, and that really puts a conflict within her story, and it actually goes to an interesting place. I'm very interested to see how they, you know, how they handle in the third movie, because it's definitely different from the book. Rebecca Ferguson, who I thought was an absolute standout in the first movie, uh, a huge surprise in the first movie, is even better here, but in such a different way. Rebecca Ferguson's character also goes through a transformation early in the film, and she's essentially playing a completely, like, a completely different character in this movie. Like, she is so different than anything that she did in the first movie, and it works so well to the plot of the story. It's weird. It's just so... I don't want to say anything else about it because I don't want to spoil it, but it's great. She's amazing in everything, but no different here. Javier Bardem, so good in this. Javier Bardem, one of the best actors we have working, and nobody really gives him the credit he deserves. He is unbelievable in this movie. I have not seen enough people talking about Javier Bardem's performance here. He is just so, so great. He's actually really funny at times in this movie, but just so, like, he he really sells the side of the Fremen that he's a part of in, in this, this idea that a lot of them are very, very religious versus some other ones that aren't religious and he sells the religious side he sells the belief and it's beautifully done he's so good here and then of course austin butler i mean everybody's talking about him yeah he's fucking amazing here this is one of those performances that i feel like people are just gonna remember for years and years and years this is an oscar performance i we have a long time till next year's oscars this year's oscars haven't even happened yet uh, but I think he will probably end up being in the conversation to win that one. This is so different from anything else I've ever seen Austin Butler done. He's creepy. He's weird. He sells that psychotic vibe that they were going for with this character. But amongst the psychoticness, some of the decisions this character makes to just, you know, kill people around him and some of the terrible things he does... 
There's also a weird sense of intelligence and control that he really portrays with this character super, super well. It makes this character more than just a crazy nut job and more like, and I've heard other people compare him like to this person, but Keith Ledger's Joker, it's sim similar to that character, how that character was psychotic, crazy chaos, but also just really intelligent and kind of controlled chaos. And, and what makes the character really work as well is somehow in the Harkonnen family, he seems to be the most honorable. What? <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense because the character's so crazy and does some terrible things throughout the film, but yeah, it is also sort of true and it makes for that ramp up to the final fight uh, in the movie that we've seen in the teasers so beautiful and so satisfying how that fight plays out. And just what a character, just so, 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 so well done. There are some people in this movie that I think were a little underutilized, and I think partially because their characters are being saved for Dune Messiah, Dune Part 3. They're, they're kind of like teased in this movie for Dune Part 3, the same way Zendaya was teased in Dune Part 1 for this movie. Uh, some of those characters, Florence Pugh as, uh, like, the Empress or the, the daughter of the Emperor, she really doesn't have too much to do here. She's definitely probably utilized the most of any of the new characters, uh, but she doesn't get to do too, too much. I definitely think her role will be expanded on in the next movie. Christopher Walken as the Emperor, I think he was kind of completely wasted. I thought that was a great casting. He barely does anything in this movie, but, 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 he still has that Christopher Walken charm and that kind of presence that he brings. I also feel like Dave Bautista was kind of thrown to the side in this one. He, he had his moments, he had a couple moments in this movie, but I definitely wish there was more Dave Bautista. I love him. Now everything else in the movie, obviously visually, Denis is probably the best visual director on planet Earth. Have you seen any of his movies? Blade Runner, Arrival, all of them are just stunning and epic and huge in scale, and this is probably his best. There are some shots in this movie that are so unbelievable, I have not even the slightest clue on how they did them both in a practical sense and in a effect, you know, a CGI stance. Like, I just, I have no idea. Some of them are really, really beautiful, especially early in the movie when you're just fo following Paul and the, the Fremen throughout the deserts of Arrakis and just watching them sort of train and, you know, experience the cultures of that people. And there are just some shots visually that are unreal, man. And it just keeps going and going and going all the way until the third act. Just a beautiful movie to look at. The sound design of this movie is punchy. It's loud. It made the entire movie theater feel like an earthquake the entire film. And it's just so great. The sound effects for everything. Like, I mean, they just so, get so creative with it. The sound effects of different cultures, different planets. They made it sound as unhuman and as foreign to Earth and our culture as humanly possible, which is great because a lot of other, you know, series that take place in sci-fi universes in space like Star Wars, they don't really make as much of an effort to really dif differentiate the cultures and the, just like the basic sounds people make, you know, from human culture. But realistically speaking, if there were to be other worlds out in space, stuff like that would be really weird and different to us personally, but to them it's normal. And Dune really captures that. There's some weird fucking shit anytime you leave Arrakis and you're going to look at other planets it's crazy. This world, like, of Dune, not just Arrakis, but the universe, is so weird and interesting and so, like, it's a world that I don't want to live in. Like, it, it seems so terrible and gross and evil, but at the same time, it's so fascinating and so rich with characters. Now, I will say, I do think this movie, and maybe this is a hot take, maybe this is a hot take, but this movie does have a couple small problems, all right? Mainly, I think it peaks a little bit early on. I think the first act of this movie is the best, which is crazy because the first act of this movie probably should have been the worst. It's the it's literally an hour of Paul Atreides just running around the desert learning how to be a Fremen. That shouldn't work after the very action-packed first movie that promised for an even bigger second movie. It, it's kind of weird to slow it down and be like, all right, let's just... Let's just have Paul explore the desert for a little bit. But it it really, really works. Like, so, seeing the Fremen in their culture and, you know, the, the sandworms and what they do with them and, and the different the different ways they fight the Harkonnens, it was just so cool to me. And it had some of the best fight scenes of the entire movie, some of the best visual stuff. I absolutely loved this section of the movie. The second act is also great, but the second act does slow down a little bit. And there are some moments in that second act that I think could have been cut down. I don't think this movie could have been... I, think, I honestly think he probably could have cut about 20 minutes off this movie just from that second act. There were a few moments that I think dragged on a little bit too long, which made the third act, which is really, really epic, but they made it feel 
a little bit rushed. The third act, I think you could have taken 20 minutes off that second act and applied it to the third act. Because my god, that third act is epic. So much crazy shit happens. Everything the entire two movies was building up to, it happens in that third act. You've been waiting for it. There's a big fight. All the different sides of this conflict are coming to a head. Everything is so epic. It looks amazing. But then it just ends, like, really fast. Like, it all happens so, so fast, and I don't know if it was purposefully designed that way, or if it was supposed to be drawn out longer, but they wanted to get the movie under three hours, I don't know, but man, that third act could have been like 20 minutes, it could have been 40 minutes longer, and I would have been fine with it, because it was so good what we got, it just developed very, 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 very fast, and it flew by, uh, and that's probably my only problem with the movie, if I'm gonna be honest, and is that even a problem? My problem is that I wanted more of a third act, because the third act is amazing, the whole movie is fucking spectacular, it's almost, it's one of those movies, it's one of those rare movies, and we've had a few recently, Oppenheimer, for me, Anatomy of a Fall, one of those rare movies where you watch it, and you can't believe it's actually real, you can't believe that this is something that somebody conceived, that somebody made, that this was somehow put together, put on camera, Camera, put together in an editing room and released. It just feels impossible. The the visual scale, the the thematic scale that Denis goes goes into in this film, his complete understanding of this world and the story he wants to tell, his confidence with every frame of the camera, his confidence with, with, with where he wants to take these characters, how he wants them to develop into their full character arcs. It is so unbelievable. It is a director and a filmmaker working at the highest possible level this industry could ever offer you, and it's a very, very special moment and a very special film, because this is not something that we get every year, this is not something that we get very often, and I think we all need to be very appreciative of this film and the fact that we have this guy, Denis, working in Hollywood in his prime right now and just so confident in his abilities that he's able to put out a work like this. And we have Hans Zimmer working right now, because holy shit, Hans Zimmer, wow, somehow expanded on the score from the first movie and made it even better. The score in this film is unreal. I leaned over to the person I saw this movie with five different times during this movie and said, this score is, is ridiculous. It's just so ridiculously good. I also want to say the ending, and I can't really, I'll talk about it more on the spoiler stuff. I really love the ending here, because the book ends a little bit differently, and the book doesn't exactly end on, say, a cliffhanger, but Denis made it very, you know, obvious, he's been very loud about the fact that this, he sees it as a trilogy, he sees it as the first book being two movies, and then Dune Messiah closing out the trilogy, right, and so the books didn't really structure it that way in the sense that it's a trilogy, right, so because that is now structured this way, this film is the middle part, and Dune Messiah is the finale, which is going to be hard to do because Dune Messiah is not as action-packed of a movie. But regardless, to do Dune Messiah, you kind of had to bleed into it with this movie, which the book doesn't necessarily try to do as hard, but this one does. And it gives you a very different Dune ending than I was expecting, and I loved it. But I'll talk about it more in the spoiler part. But overall, Dune Part 2 is an absolute masterpiece. I can't imagine that there's going to be anything else this year that's better than this. This is probably the best movie of the year. It might have been the best movie of last year. Like I said, last year was a crazy freaking year. But this thing is an absolute masterpiece, man. It is a masterwork from one of the best filmmakers of all time. Not just of now, but of all time. A guy who has such a great future ahead of him. And a guy that already has established himself a, a legacy that is going to be unmatched by just about everybody. It's unbelievable what this man has been able to do in a very short period of time. And this movie might be his crown jewel. I don't know. I gotta go back and watch a lot of his other stuff. But this might be his crown jewel. It is phenomenal. It lives up to every expectation. It lives up to the name of Dune that Frank Herbert established when he wrote the epic, masterful, you know, series of books. It lives up to the sci-fi genre. It lives up to everything you could ever expect from a sci-fi film. I've heard a lot of people compare this movie, that this moment, this movie, watching the second part of a trilogy, it, it feels like what a lot of people must have felt when the Lord of the Rings trilogy came out. It felt like this impossible thing, this adaptation of these amazing books, and this impossible scope and epicness that just nobody ever thought could ever actually happen. Now, I was not around when those movies came out. I never experienced that. I was also not around when the Star Wars trilogy came out, the original one, because I've also heard a lot of people comparing it to that. But I am around now, and I think I get it. I think I understand what that means. I think I understand the feelings that those people must have felt experiencing something this amazing like this for the first time. Yes, go see Dune Part 2. I know I'm the 15,000 person to tell you to see Dune Part 2. Go see it. Enjoy it. 
then come back to this video and listen to my spoiler part, which starts right now. I'm going to start talking about a little bit of spoilers. Not too long. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ramble for too, too long. For the spoilers, the main thing I want to talk about is how this movie is actually going to bleed into Dune Messiah, because there are some interesting ideas that this film presented different ideas that the book also presented, but maybe not as directly. So obviously the whole point of Dune is that Paul Atreides is kind of like this false prophet. The whole book is sort of a warning to not put all of your hopes and dreams into messiah type figures, because most of the time they rise up and they become sort of a tyrannical government that ends up being very evil, very terrible, and not very good. And that's exactly what sort of happens in the Dune universe. Paul Atreides, after he defeats uh, uh, the, the Harkonnens and the Emperor, and he becomes the Emperor, his, uh, you know, government and his empire becomes pretty evil. The Fremen go on this long jihad that ends up with billions and billions of people being murdered. So, like, Paul Atreides rising to power was really atrocious for the galaxy. It was not a heroic moment. It's not a heroic story. It's a really terrible, tragic tale that also, in turn, if you really want to get into the deepness of the Dune universe, it kind of actually was a good thing for the future because I think Paul, when he drinks that liquid, he sort of sees the future and the sprawling futures and he sees the golden path, which, you know, leads to humanity, you know, winning and prospering or whatever. And the only way to go down that golden path is for him to become a tyrannical figure and billions of people to die and that his son to eventually become like a worm thing and Dune is fucking weird, man. But either way, the early story, the early themes of these books is the fact that Paul is not actually the savior figure. He's actually really a tragic figure. This guy that sort of also, you know, everybody gets swept up into, and he's getting swept up into the fate of everything, and he ends up becoming this really tyrannical dude. And if you really watch the David Lynch movie, or if you just read the original book, it's easy to get swept up into the idea that it's just a basic hero story. This guy who gets betrayed by the Harkonnens, you know, his whole family gets murdered, and he has to, you know, kind of run rise up with the, you know, quote-unquote rats to overthrow the evil government and take over. Like, it's a real hero story. It's a classic hero story. And then the twist really comes in Dune Messiah, where it's like, oh, just wait. It's really not a heroic story. It's actually kind of the opposite of that. And Denis doesn't really waste time because he knows this is a trilogy and he knows he's doing Dune Messiah. He decides to play out those themes right away. And the, the smart way that he accomplished this was through Zendaya's Chani character. And I thought... It was brilliant. The way that she is doubtful of Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides, that she thinks, like, you're not the Messiah, man, and if if you go through with this, it's gonna get bad. These people will believe, they will do anything for you if they believe that you're the Messiah. And Timothy is very honest about it through the whole movie. He says, man, if I go, to, go down south to these Fremen who are very extreme with their religion, if I go south, things are gonna get bad, man. Billions of people are gonna die, so maybe I shouldn't do it, maybe I shouldn't go through, but also I kind of have to... I don't know, like, they really put these questions in Paul Atreides' minds and in the minds of Shani with this rift between those two characters that start to sell the fact to the audience that, guys, this dude's not really a hero, and it's going to get bad even if he wins. It's gonna actually get worse if he wins. And that really leads into the ending of this movie, which in the book, and in the original movie, and everything they've ever done with Dune, is really a heroic ending. You know, he wins, he beats, you know, he beats all the bad guys, he becomes emperor, hooray, he gets the girl, everybody's happy, but in this version, he wins, and there's a sense of dread. And I heard Christopher Nolan compare this movie to Empire Strikes Back, and it's got that same sense of dread in the final moments of, oh man, like this is actually not good. They just slaughtered all these people. Uh, now they're going to fight like all the other royal families. There's a line where when they say the royal families, they won't they won't support you. And he says, uh, Paul Atreides goes, bring them the paradise. And it's like, oh man, like this is gonna get rough for these people. Like, it, it really sells that sense of, oh shit, this is not a hero story. Paul Atreides is a tragic, Shakespearean-type character who's just kind of fallen from grace. And maybe there's a reason for it in the long term of speaking. Maybe there's long-term reasons for it, because, you know, if you read the book, you know there kind of is. But at the same time, it's really sort of sad, and he's not this messiah. And I think Denis did such a good job of bringing that aspect of Dune and the themes of it into this story where you probably wouldn't expect it to be originally when they first announced this movie. Because it's also a risky move when you have a gigantic sci-fi movie that costs a lot of money and they need to sell this to general audiences. It's hard to, it's, it's very easy to sell the classic hero story. Classic hero, Timothy Chalamet plays Paul Atreides, classic hero. He's gonna fight the bad guys, take over, win. Hooray, hooray, that's an easy sell. It's a much harder sell to be like, no, we're gonna tell a much deeper, 
denser story that has so many more themes that kind of relate to the real world when it comes to religious aspects and how we put, how we kind of fall into these cult of personalities, these great leaders who are sort of religious figures in a sense in our real world. That's a, it's a much tougher story to sell on a grand level, but the fact that they pull it off, Brilliant! So where does that lead us in the Dune Messiah? Now, Dune Messiah is going to be a really tough movie to adapt. You know, I've read some of the book. I know what happens in pretty much the whole book. It's very, very different than Dune. It's less action-packed. Like, there's no gigantic major war between all these families. There is the Jihad, which I, I, I'm very interested to see how they adapt that. There's also a time jump, which I'm kind of... I don't think they're going to do, because they might, you know, if they do, like, the 13, 15-year time jump, they either A have to wait the 15 years to make the movie, or, like, are they really gonna recast some of these characters? I don't see that happen. But if they don't do the time jump, they're also not gonna have Paul's sister in the movie, like, of age, which, in you know, uh, maybe they want it that way? I don't know. But either way, Anna Taylor-Joy, by the way, cameo in this movie, playing Paul's sister, like, in a vision. What a surprise. But I have a feeling Doom Messiah is gonna be very different, and they're gonna kinda stray from the book a little bit. I definitely think they're gonna hit all of the major beats from the book, but like with Doom Part 2, they're gonna stray from the book a little bit, but keep those central themes, and I think that's what they're gonna do with Doom Messiah, and they're gonna have to find a way to really ramp up the tensions, ramp up the stakes on everything, uh, to really make it feel like a big trilogy ender, and I trust Denis is gonna be able to do that. Uh, but I'm very interested to see how they portray Paul, as this kind of tyrannical leader that the, the sections of the galaxy want to overthrow and there's kind of conspiracies to try to kill him. It's going to be a very different movie. It's going to be a lot closer to Game of Thrones than these first two movies. These first two movies are very much Game of Thrones in space, but very action-heavy, very action-oriented at its core, very dark, very adventurous. Dude Messiah is very much Game of Thrones. It's this emperor who's kind of, you know, everybody's conspiring against. He's got family issues. He's balancing the empire. He's balancing everything that had happened happened because he had rose to power. It's a much different story, and I'm very excited to see how Denis treats it as a trilogy ender to build this perfect trilogy of Dune movies and put a nice little cherry on top. Because it's such a cool universe, and I would love to see it expanded. Now, I don't know if you can adapt Children of Dune. I definitely don't think you can adapt God Emperor or anything that comes after that. Like, Dune gets weird. If you're not familiar with the Dune books, it gets fucking weird, man, and strange. It always kind of keeps those core themes and concepts, which is why they're brilliant novels, uh, because they never stray from the base ideas of what Dune is. But it really jumps from being a simple adventure, heroic story, to being something so much deeper, and then something so much crazier, very, very, very fast. I think they can maybe do Children of Dune, but it's hard to do Children of Dune and not do God Emperor. I don't know. We'll see. But either way, guys, I love Dune Part 2, obviously, and I think you should go see it. And yeah, I'm gonna stop talking because this is like almost a 30 minute long video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe for more. Click on the video on your screen right now. I'll see you guys in the next one.